Thank you very much. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be able to get going at this very important uh, event. And I'm going to talk about integration through multilingualism, and in particular, the issue that English plays a key role, and one needs to see whether it's functioning as a panacea or as a pandemic. Meaning, if you take a dictionary definition, a pandemic is typically a disease that is widespread, prevalent, pervasive, or rife, or rampant, whereas a panacea is a cure for all ills, a universal remedy, elixir, a wonder drug. And English has been seen as both of these in countless contexts worldwide. And Joshua Fisherman, one of the grand old men of the sociology of language and sociolinguistics, wrote back in 1976, would English continue to spread as a second language the world over as a benevolent bonus or a creeping cancer of modernity? So he already was thinking in terms of the complexity, the good features, the bad features that there could be to and a language that was spreading, in fact, the world being gripped by English. I think this visualization we have there uh, on the screen is very appropriate when one considers the way English has expanded over the last two centuries. Much of the discourse surrounding the expansion of English is plagued by, in my view, invalid or unscholarly statements when you refer to English as the lingua franca of Europe, or the global language, or the language of science, this is forgetting the fact that many languages serve all those purposes. There's not just one of them. And when it's marketed as being a universal need, uh, as though every single citizen, every child needs to concentrate on English from very early on in life, that again is a simplification of the complexity of how education should be organized. And to my mind, this is an, these are all instances or examples of linguist discourse. And the concept linguicism is about societal discrimination by means of language functioning the way sexism does or racism or classism and often interlocking with those ways of hierarchization of societies. But in the case of language there involving unequal treatment, some languages are given better attention, more investment, more resources than others. And there are also a whole lot of beliefs about what certain languages should or should not be doing which influence language policy. If you go to a typical handbook of multilingualism, the Routledge handbook, quite recent, there's no entry on integration, which is puzzling when this country is devoting a lot of attention to it. So you don't get much help there. And if you look more at the index, you can see that there are no entries for key issues of language like dictionaries, vocabulary, translation, writing, or even some of the macro dimensions, neoliberalism or hegemony. And this means, in my view, that a lot of the literature in this area is very selective in what gets focused on. There tend to be fashions in applied linguistics or language pedagogy, which focus on some areas at the expense of others. So one needs to be very sure that when you think of things as a handbook, which is a kind of state-of-the-art document, you need to have a critical sense there in order to really make sure that you're concentrating on what the two speakers ahead of me were saying about the way cultural policy and language policy should ideally be handled. And if we think of the way the European Union functions by integrating 28 member states, a lot of this supranational integration is done through law meaning the treaties to found the European Union in 1958 and earlier ones, the Lisbon Constitutional Treaty, Euro law, uh, and the decisions of the European Court of Justice, those laws have priority over national law. This is one of the main features of European integration, which can be seen as integration through law. And this is very important because it means that in this particular type of activity at the European level, there is a policy of 24 official and working languages having the same rights, the same duties, the same obligations. And this is a kind of international integration through multilingualism. But we also know that even if the 
24 languages are equal and parallel for many purposes, both in speech and in writing, through translation and interpretation. Some languages are more equal than others, to rephrase George Orwell, uh, and this means that certain languages do get privilege, and I'll come back to that as we go along, so that when the conference is about sharing languages, some languages do get shared more than others. But I'm going to talk about a number of fields or areas where English is now being privileged by being learnt ever earlier in schools. At continental European universities, English being used more as the medium of instruction and publication than other languages, national or international. International schools are mushrooming worldwide. There are over 500 in the United Arab Emirates and 500 in China, which are nearly all English medium exclusively, those schools. English is the medium of instruction. There are two in uh, Tallinn, I have found out in the last few days. Universities in English-speaking countries remain monolingual and monocultural, even if the student intake in those countries is very diverse. In the United Kingdom, there are 300,000 uh, foreign students paying vast fees, except for EU students who get a privileged status. But this means that the, the, what is taught is through the medium of English, and it's a particular monocultural context. Even if, as we all know, knowledge, traditionally science, has been international for centuries uh, and is part of the history of the establishment of universities. But, and the next bullet is what I'm talking about. Now, there are branch cam campuses of many British, Australian, and American universities in other parts of the world, in Asia and the Middle East, and probably to a very small extent in continental Europe as well. And that means that those institutions are establishing themselves in other parts of the world with the same content and the same language, which has to do with the weather, the, the way English is gripping has to do with American cultures spreading worldwide or British culture spreading worldwide and gripping the world. I'll come back to that. Other bodies which are influential here are the British Council, private corporations and non-governmental organizations, some of which are promoting English medium schools in basic education worldwide, typically in former colonies in Africa and in, and in parts of India. Other examples then are the way the publishers from mainly the United States and the U United Kingdom, also the Dutch to some extent, are becoming more and more globalized, uh, selling worldwide and making most of their money uh, in other countries. We also know, any of us who are scientists, scholars, that journals published in English are more influential than others and this, of course, influences the, 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 the way policies for disseminating knowledge get uh, privileged in some ways. The journal like The Economist uh, is published in over one million paper copies e every week. And this clearly is a British journal which has become international. And in many of the business world contexts, uh, English is now declared as one of the corporate languages. In Denmark, where I've lived for over 40 years, many companies, especially the bigger ones, have established English as a corporate language, or possibly even sometimes the corporate language, particularly in the IT uh, sector. Although, in fact, the reality, of course, is often that it's a bilingual policy and very much uh, one where it depends which level of the organization people are working in, uh, what the language policy should be. Back to the EU system, uh, one of the ways in which language policy has been influenced since the United Kingdom and Ireland and Denmark joined in 1973, and then the much bigger enlargement later with, of course, the Baltic states as well, uh, has been that whereas French was the dominant in-house language earlier, uh, this has progressively become English uh, in the last 20, 30 years. And this has very important uh, influences on how things are done in-house by people working within the EU institutions, in particular in, particular in the Commission, which has the right of initiative, has the right to 
state which issues are important and to try to formulate policies uh, there. Earlier, if you go back 30 years, 60% of texts were initially drafted in French and 40% in German. Now, something like 90% are drafted in English. And this means that the conceptual universe of English is being used in order to formulate those policies. So that in, it, it's a fact that in terms of the institutions, the parliament and the commission in particular, to some extent the Council of Ministers as well, English has become very privileged. And this is not the case in the European Court of Justice, which is also an extremely important institution because court cases, to some extent, are extending European law, what they decide on policy when they're interpreting the law, as it's called, is often extending the law, it's constitutionalizing. And when one knows that the European treaties, in particular the Lisbon Treaty, are neoliberal, the economic policies there are embedded in the European constitution. And this is why the, the whole economic system is very difficult to change if neoliberalism, as we all know, is privileging some and not others. So that's where the Court of Justice is very important, but French is still the dominant language there. All the judges, one from each of the 28 member states, have to be able to function in French in order to make decisions. And at the lower level, the advocates general, which are also very important within that system, not many people know much about uh, this, but there is a vast amount of legal activity taking place in Luxembourg and the advocates general are entitled to use their mother tongues, to use whatever language they want to use in order to create the document which can be a foundation for European law. So it's a, it's a, it's a good example of the complexity of some of the ways in which the European Union operates. I'm supposed to be going to Paris for a conference next month on the European Court of Justice. Uh, but it's been cancelled because there's a train strike that day. And as you probably all know, trade unions are very strong in France. And there seem to be strikes every year, more or less. So it's been postponed. Another example, of course, in the way English is expanded is the way NATO is primarily an English language body, French to a much lesser extent. And there is global activity by the Americans. There are, the Americans, for instance, are active in 49 countries. Uh, in, their, in their military forces. Uh, and NATO has been expanded all over Asia as well. NATO has been globalized effectively. And of course this strengthens the learning of English for all sorts of purposes in member states or in members of, the, of, of NATO. And of course there's Hollywood and the technologies of the so-called social media and Amazon and everything else. All of those are factors which explain and which contribute to the strength of English as, as a dominant language. And English can be used for moral purposes, for humane purposes. And Greta Thunberg is a wonderful example of the way English can be used for very positive purposes. And she's using English very effectively as a foreign language. And obviously English is being used uh, for all sorts of purposes, including here in this room, uh, for what I hope are very constructive purposes. And English brings all of us together. So I'm not saying that everything I say here is, is to do with critiquing or is, is worrying about the way English can be unjust in the way it's being functioning at, at the moment. But it does also do that, as we know, because English can also be used for egocentric or narcissistic or ignoble purposes, whether it's used as a mother tongue, which it is in this case, by this immigrant to the United States, whom you can see on the screen, well, his ancestors anyway. And uh, this is why we need to consider it whether the roles being performed by English are as a panacea or as a pandemic. So what we need to really analyze if we are researchers in this area is how English is used, for what purposes, because there's nothing intrinsic to any language that can explain an expansion. It's nothing to do with the nature of the language itself, far from it. But there are lots of myths and beliefs about some languages being superior to others. And French had an ideology of the superiority, superiority of French for a couple of centuries. Uh, and this is still to some extent uh, that the French tend to believe in. So what's crucial is the purposes that a language serves, uh, 
the resources invested in it, in school timetables, for instance, in contrast with other languages, the beliefs about a language, and the roles that all languages perform. And English, like any other dominant language, can be used to include or exclude. It privileges those who can function well in, in the language in many countries worldwide, and it excludes from participation a lot of the people who uh, do not become competent in English. And in my view, all of these issues that I'm addressing in my talk exist at the macro level of international pressures, which I've just highlighted, and the meso level of what happens in an institution, which could be a university uh, or a department or a television channel or uh, a company. And at, thirdly, at the micro level of interpersonal interactions, which a lot of people are going to be talking about in the next two days. So if we go then to my first example, the fact that English is being studied ever earlier in schools in continental Europe, what this has entailed is a concomitant contraction of the learning of French, German and Russian as foreign languages in education systems in many countries in Europe. Uh, and this is definitely the case in, in, in Denmark and Sweden. I actually live now in, in Sweden where competence in those other languages used to be fairly widespread, French and German in particular, but is definitely less so now. Then secondly, if time is given to English on the timetable, as well as the national language or one of the two national languages, the time for English may entail the marginalization of minority languages. And this could either be local autochthonous languages regional languages, or it can be migrant languages as well. There may be simply more pressure to exclude them from time on task in schools. And this means that for speakers of those languages, which we heard your minister saying we need to show respect for and, and, and use and validate, if there's a lot of concentration on national languages and English, this can be result in the marginalization of other languages and an enforced insimilation for speakers of those languages rather than a healthy integration. And if we think of the concepts now, integration is bidirectional. It is uh, a reciprocal process, whereas assimilation is unidirectional. So assimilation means being forcibly transferred to another group, which can constitute cultural and linguistic genocide. And my wife, uh, Tove Skutnap Gangas, who was with me in Estonia 30 years ago in Brezhnev times and 20 years ago, uh, which was the last time I was here. It's a great pleasure to be back in a very different Estonia. Uh, the three of us, uh, Tove and an international human rights lawyer, Robert Dunbar, uh, were invited by a regional government in Canada in the Inuit in the northwest of the country to assess whether their education system for people whose mother tongue, in the case of 90% of the population, is an Inuit language, neither French nor English, whether that education, which is mainly through English, can be considered a crime in international or national law uh, and can constitute linguistic and cultural genocide. And the study of residential schools in Canada has been condemned as being cultural genocide by uh, official reports quite recently. There's a link to that in the set of references which I've given you so that topics that I'm trying to cover rather rapidly in this context, just in a few minutes, uh, for those of you who, who want, uh, there are lots of references to follow up there. There is a link to that, to that study. But my point really here is that if we think of assimilation as opposed to integration, uh, both within countries and also worldwide, there may be macro-level processes which can be either assimilation or integration. And membership of the European Union also involves processes of both assimilation and integration. Integration because, right back from the Treaty of Rome from 1958, it states that the citizens in each member state are working for an ever closer union of the peoples of Europe. 
And this means that the way the EU is evolving is something where there's a great deal of dispute or disagreement because some people, including people like Jean Monnet, have wanted to create the United States of Europe, a federation. And there have been policies to try to establish the European Union as a federation in the same way as federal countries like Germany or Canada. Whereas others think that the EU should be exclusively intergovernmental and should only be links between independent, autonomous nation states. There was a Danish prime minister who 20 years ago said that Danish membership did not involve any kind of loss of sovereignty, which of course is not true. A great deal of sovereignty is now operated at the supranational European level. So this, this was a perfect example of the way even respectable politicians are either mistaken or consciously lie in the way they inform the public about how things operate. And the other thing, as I mentioned a bit earlier, is that in addition to this difference in the way different countries or different individuals see the intensification of European integration as either moving towards a federation or to a continu con continuation of intergovernmental uh, partnership. The Lisbon Treaty actually enshrines market forces. It's a neoliberal document explicitly, and that means that this impacts on language policy at the supranational, national, and subnational levels. And the first book on the European Union's language policies was written uh, by a Franco-Canadian, Norman Labry, and my own book came out in 2003 and has just recently been translated in, into French with, with an update. But here's a wonderful example of the way language policy is poorly understood by journalists, because The Economist that I mentioned earlier, in its number in June, the 15th of June, has the main story, Brexit is the ideal moment to make English the EU's common language. And there is this one-page statement about why this should happen, and it's full of false statements, linguist statements about English. Uh, people tend to think that a lot might change if and when Brexit takes place, but I think it's very unlikely that the dominant role of English internally will in fact change uh, as time goes by. Uh, that in particular, anyone who works for the European Union permanently as a Eurocrat has a loyalty not to the country of origin, but to the Union. And it's the same with the commissioners, the 28, one from each country. Their loyalty for their period of five or four years in, in, in Brussels uh, and Strasbourg as commissioners, their loyalty is in fact to the suprastatal institutions and not to their country of origin. This is the, the theory of it, at least. Uh, but uh, I think it's extremely unlikely that uh, people who work in the institutions uh, will want to change anything to do with altering the current status of English as the dominant in-house language and the dominant house language used externally by EU institutions. So far as the role of English within the EU is concerned, there is translation and interpretation for all of the 24 official and working languages for important documents, Eurolaw, directives and so on, and for high-level meetings, much less for lower-level meetings. And there's a lot of anecdotes about ministers saying what they didn't mean when they used rather less than brilliant English. Uh, but I won't give you any of those stories. Some of them are in my book. Um, English is the dominant in-house language, as I've said already, but this grants English a privileged status de facto, but not de jure. It, it might change. There might be more use of French a little bit. And I've talked about the European Court of Justice already. I won't mention that again. So that multilingualism in the EU is a reality for many purposes, but in many EU policies there is a linguist privileging of English, for example, in research applications. Any of you who are academics and who have had the misfortune of needing to apply to the European Union for funding from the Directorate General of Research will know that you have the right to do your application in any of the 24 official languages, 
But if you're stupid enough to do it in Estonian or in Latvian or in Portuguese, you are invited uh, to provide a translation into English as well. So clearly this is a perfect example of the way academics who may have a Romance language as their primary working language, or a Finno-Ugric language as their primary international language, are in fact being discriminated against in the way projects are submitted, and also then in the analysis process, in the evaluation of projects. I've been involved in this for over a decade, so I know how it works. And very definitely, I've complained about it to the EU, but they think that this is the only way they can operate. But of course, that just doesn't explain why it's, it is in fact helping some more than others. But if we go then to the big picture, to the macro level, I think that one of the concepts that's important when looking at the expansion of English into other continents, the Americas, Australasia, and so on, the doctrine was produced by philosophers called terra nullius, a doctrine to justify European territorial expansion into the Americans and Australasia and Africa. And this was the myth of null or unoccupied territory. And the consequence of this then was that there was dispossession of the territories and the cultures and the languages of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and Australia with catastrophic consequences for those cultures. There is, of course, a revitalization taking place now in parts of the United States and Australia and so on, which is very important. There's a very good new handbook of revitalization with lots of examples of that. But until now, there has been massive dispossession. So what has been considered as success for Homo Americanus in all of those countries uh, is in fact failure for those who are dispossessed. And this is also true in the way the Chinese are behaving. In fact, when I look at those hands there, I think that historically for the last 200 years, those have been American hands basically grabbing the world. And now we have Chinese hands doing something very, very similar. And I think that the way Chinese interests are expanding economically, politically, linguistically with Confucius Institutes means that they have a very similar agenda to the Americans and are extremely effective in influencing, influencing things at the moment in a way that the Soviet Union failed to do. So that uh, Homo Sovieticus, as you know very well in this part of the world, uh, failed to achieve its, obje its objectives. It's also important to see globalization as a cultural dimension, and there are good scholars who worked on cultura nullius, meaning regarding this culture as being the one that needs to dominate worldwide, which has to do with Americanization in the military area, economic and cultural, McDonaldization. And this is something that influences all of us in academia, it influences the business world, the media, advertising, lifestyles, this struck me very strongly driving in from the airport yesterday to the, to the hotel. You could almost be in any city or any part of the Western world. And there's a wonderful new book by Regis Debray, which has actually just been translated into English, How We Have Become Americans in France, of all places. But neoliberal commodification principles do get internalized as, as cultural norms, so that the link between the economy and cultural norms is a very, very strong one. And consumerist capitalism is internalized as a necessity in the modern world. And there's been a transition from the cultural Cold War during what used to be the Cold War, nowadays to much of a technological Cold War with competition between California and the Chinese with Huawei. What about my country of origin, the United Kingdom? Well, I quote Winston Churchill on linguistic globalization because he was given an honorary doctorate in Harvard in 1943, meaning during the war when the British were in a pathetically hopeless state and it looked as though Hitler might be succeeding in conquering the UK as well as the rest of continental Europe. Had it not been for the Americans, this would probably have happened. And Churchill was basically interested in language policy, among other things. The power to control language offers far better prizes than taking away people's provinces or lands or grinding them down in exploitation. The empires of the future are the empires of the mind. Have you ever heard of the knowledge economy? It's, very, it's a very f far sighted judgment. 
But this was one of five themes in that lecture of his, one of which was that the British and the Americans share a common past and present. And those people who are in favor of Brexit have this naive idea of reuni reuniting the white former parts of the empire in an Anglosphere. And there's a reference to this in my list of references as well. It's, it's this neoliberal fantasy which the, the Brexit key persons still believe in. So secondly, military collaboration, which resulted in NATO. Thirdly, global peacekeeping, United Nations. Churchill wanting to ensure that the British were there as part of American global dominance in a very junior role. And then the final one, then the expansion of English worldwide. English being projected as a lingua nulli, as a language that everyone should benefit from. And the way English has expanded, and the way there are books now on global English and global English teaching and so on, uh, has been a conscious effort on the part of the Americans and the British since the 1930s when the first conference on English as a world language was held in the United States and with intensive investment in this in both the UK and the US from the 1950s onwards. So I think that it's, it's also true nowadays to see the business of English language teaching and learning as a global professional service industry. And this is because there are similarities to the way consultancy firms operate, international banks and stock exchanges, and the accountancy big four, Ernst and & Young and KPMG, Deloitte, I'm sure that these are active in this country because they are active in 150 countries worldwide employing nearly a million people. And they do the auditing of all the top companies uh, worldwide in the global economy. And obviously they're using English for that. So dovetailing with that is English language education. The teaching business, the testing industry, three million people take the Cambridge IELTS exams every year. It's a huge money spin spinning activity. Publishers I've mentioned already, consultancies, conferences and so on. And British Council offices in nearly 100 countries are of course also promoting English in this way. And international schools I'll talk about briefly, and English medium expansion in higher education as well as schools. So the empirical question for anyone involved in universities where English is increasingly used at this meso level is, is there a contraction, a reduction of publication in other foreign languages or in other national languages? Is there a downgrading of national languages? It, it needs investigation. Is there a canonization of English as the hegemonic lingua academica? Is there an explicit institutional language policy or not? A, a policy for all relevant languages. And there are, has been a great deal of study of this in Scandinavia and Finland and in Germany and France. There's quite a large literature on these issues. And one of the things that I think is very disappointing about the Bologna process, which has to do with the creation of a higher education area, is that the language dimension was never explicitly addressed. It's always been hidden there away, so that when ministers meet every two years to assess how Bologna has evolved, there's never been a consideration of, of promoting multilingualism through Bologna. It's a, it's a missed opportunity. And then if one is looking at this in, in a university anywhere in, in Europe, what are the pandemic or panacea symptoms and consequences? International schools tend to neglect the mother tongue of learners because it's all done through English and to neglect local cultural history. And that's because the syllabus and the exams are from the American baccalaureate or the Cambridge exams from the UK. And because students in those schools are being prepared to go to elite universities in the United States or the United Kingdom largely, whether they are international people or nationals. The European schools function rather differently. But in my view, I think it's fair to say, and there are books now on this, that English serves to integrate those young people into the neoliberal global economy, creating transnational elites and to detach them from local involvement and challenges. How is academia faring in neoliberal times? Well, there's a great deal of criticism in several countries of the way university autonomy and academic freedom are being severely constrained. 
There are several books from England, and I have these references in the list. Because universities are functioning much more as businesses than they used to, and when one talks about English as soft power, I think one needs to make sure that one remembers that the only countries that talk about soft power always have economic and military and political power behind the softness. So it's a, it's a very suspicious, in my view, it's, it's a misused concept. But in fields in linguistics, in applied linguistics and language pedagogy, there is a dominant American and British influence. Although at universities in the United Kingdom, there is a strong non-British staff presence, which some of the speakers of this conference are a very good example of. Continental Europeans who are fortunately improving the quality of British higher education. But I think one needs to be very skeptical about some of the concepts that are, that are waved around without specifying what's meant by translanguaging or superdiversity. I won't go into that, but I think that the concept lingua franca, which is also very widely used, needs to be pinned out, needs to be dissected into what context one is talking about. So I would prefer people to restrict it to a lingua academica or a lingua economica in the business and banking world or a lingua cultura. And I think that's very important for foreign language education because clearly if you learn French or German English, it's often in relation to the culture where that language evolved and to some extent is still used. Although, of course, in the case of English, that could be many cultures nowadays, if you include South Africa and India and so on. Uh, and it, clearly, English is used as a lingua bellica in, in, in many contexts. And English has functioned as a lingua Frankenstein in lots of contexts. Interestingly enough, university autonomy and academic freedom are guaranteed in the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights. So it shouldn't be possible, in, in theory, one could go to the European Court of Justice to complain about the way universities are being turned into businesses rather than seekers of knowledge and truth. And just to give you one example of lingua academicas, this was a, a research project done by three people in the University of Cambridge. And you can see from those figures that there are many languages which are used in scientific communication, in journals. And these were found on, on Google Scholar. So there are many lingua academica. And the interesting thing then is that scholars who are restricted to functioning in English are missing out on knowledge which has been generated and uh, coded and written about in, in lots of other languages. And this applies to the large languages, which you can see on the screen, but it also applies to a smaller language, which could include the Baltic languages as well as, say, Swedish or Danish, where there is a lot of activity in those languages, uh, including uh, in the language policy field. If you're following that, you need to be able to read the Nordic languages as well as the big major foreign languages. So in my view, and I'm beginning to wrap up, English has functioned as an imperialist language in many contexts worldwide. And linguistic imperialism entails resources and ideologies, push and pull factors, which can be investigated empirically at macro, meso and micro levels. And in continental Europe, the way English is expanding involves risks, but will avoid being either a panacea or a pandemic if strong measures are enforced to ensure multilingualism. And studies of whether the expansion of English in the Nordic countries, and it could be the Baltic as well, represent a threat or not, is something that has been addressed. Because the Nordic governments, meaning Scandinavia and Finland, have a policy for universities and the parallel use of English and Nordic languages, meaning that the governments of those five countries have agreed that it should be possible to use both the languages of the Nordic countries, essential to society, and English as languages of science. That the presentation of results, scientific scholarship, in the languages of the Nordic countries, essential to society, be rewarded. You shouldn't get a huge bonus if you write in English and nothing if you write in Norwegian or Estonian. Instruction in scientific technical language, especially in written form, to be given in both English and the languages of the Nordic countries, essential to society. It's a policy for bilingual education in higher education, even though it's never called bilingual education so far. 
And then that universities, colleges, and other scientific institutions can develop long-range strategies for the choice of language, the parallel use of languages, language instruction and translation grants within their fields. This document is in my list of uh, references, and it's in eight Nordic languages and in English. And then there's a more detailed document, which is possibly now in the Scandinavian languages and English only, called More Parallel, Please, Best Practice of Parallel Language Use at Nordic Universities with Recommendations. And I'll run through these extremely quickly, because basically they're saying that all meso-level institutions like a university should have a language policy integrated with their internationalization policy. Secondly, there should be a language policy committee to follow things and make sure that implementation takes place. Thirdly, a language center with a wide range of functions, and I won't go into the detail there. Very interestingly, fourthly, international, so-called meaning foreign teaching and research staff should be instructed in forms of parallel academic language use and features of local students' dialogue. They should be able to function in the national language where they work for the university administration, and this should be in their employment contract. So you can't just have foreigners brought in not bothering to learn the local language. They have to become competent in the local language. Fifthly, needs analysis. Sixthly, specialized needs analysis. Criteria for choice of languages in different contexts. Principles for the language of minority, uh, sorry, university administration, languages of publication, research dissemination, and digital tools. So I'm, I'm summarizing 12 pages of document there, which you can follow up if you're interested in this, because I think it's extremely interesting as a step towards institutionalizing bilingualism in higher education. I think the fact that it is only bilingualism rather than multilingualism shows something about the strength of English, because ideally it should be with a range of other languages included. It should ideally be a multilingual policy, but that hasn't really taken place yet in, in any of the Nordic countries. So in conclusion then, for both national and international purposes, multilingualism is, is imperative, and that's why we're here. Language policy needs to address the challenges at three levels, the macro, the meso, and the micro, and it needs to be aware of the linguist pressures behind English. The mix of pandemic and panacea forces has been disastrous in the country where I worked for 40 years for linguistic diversity. My own institution, Copenhagen Business School, has progressively over the last 15 years abolished all foreign language learning, even though the commercial world and the political world are crying out for competence in lots of other languages. It's a scandalous thing which has to do with money constraints and with incompetent administration at the level of the university institution and at the governmental level. So it's, it's I mean, in, in Denmark it has been a pandemic, definitely. And I've written about this, and there's a reference to that in the material you have. So the situation is fluid in many contexts, which is why sharing relevant experience is why we are all here for this very important event. And I'm very grateful to the organizers for bringing myself here. So I will say thank you in the five languages that I use uh, more or less every day. Merci beaucoup, vielen Dank, tak so thank you for your attention.